All right, good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome you to our next session, titled The Industrial Cyber Threat Landscape, Ye uh, Year in Review Report with Updates. Uh, please welcome our speaker, Robert Lee, CEO and founder of Dragos Inc. to the stage. All right, good morning, folks. So you had lots of options and you chose this. So uh, we'll evaluate the decision-making authority later in this room, but for now, thanks for joining me. Um, so as mentioned, my name is Rob Lee. I'm a CEO over at Dragos, uh, but also a SANS instructor. How many of you, by the way, have ever taken one of my classes? I'm just always curious. Yeah, good, good. Uh, so love uh, teaching over at SANS as well and seeing good students here. Um, so this presentation is really about our year in review report. Let me just fast forward to that. Um, so what essentially, I, I love this too, by the way, disclaimer, RSA added that in. I haven't had a disclaimer since I was in the government. Um, when I was in the Air Force and in the NSA, like everything was like, disclaimer, my opinions are not the government's. Now that I'm CEO of Dragos, I can say like, my opinions are the opinions of Dragos, so that's good. Um, but year in review. When I started out in industrial security, everything was anecdotal. Just every piece of information I could find was anecdotal. It was, oh, I heard a guy who heard from a girl who heard from someone else that there was an attack over here and here's the lessons learned. Or, yeah, we think there's these vulnerabilities and, and we think some of them are impactful. Or, oh, there's a secret database with all these attacks, but nobody knows how to access it. It was a lot of anecdotal insights. And therefore, a lot of the security controls that we put in these operational technology environments or industrial control systems, kind of whatever your flavor of wording you want to use is, a lot of the controls we put in those environments ended up being copy and pasted from IT of whatever didn't break the OT environment. Not what reduces risk, not what actually adds value to the mission. It was just what can we take from IT that doesn't break the OT environment. And so we went along the way doing things that honestly oftentimes were adverse to operations. And these industrial environments, for those of you not familiar with them, everything from high-end uh, refining and power generation, and transmission, to pharmaceutical, to manufacturing, to food and beverage, they had a beautiful thing about our industrial world is it's pretty much everything. And it's hard to just drive down the road and not see a bunch of things that oftentimes you may just scoot past, but are part of that beautiful industrial world that runs on the critical part of critical infrastructure, which is that OT side. So it's really important to be able to have real insights, things that are driven from what the adversaries are actually doing, what we're learning in the field, and make sure that we adopt security controls that make sense, because you'll hear this often from our asset owners and operators when they talk about the fact that they live and work in the communities we serve. And I wanna highlight that last piece. It really is about the civilians and the communities we live in. In IT, a breach is gonna cost some data, maybe some intellectual property, maybe PII. In OT, people can die. Environmental impact can happen. So we're constantly thinking about safety and what really matters in these communities, not just how to play bingo card with a 62443 standard or something. All right, so uh, that's what we've been doing with Year in Review every year. Uh, we put this out, so it's six years running now. And the idea is ground truth reality, no hype, no silliness, just what actually happened. And as you can see over the years, um, since we've been publishing this, each one of these icons represents a threat group that we track. And the way that we think about these threat groups or adversaries is only the ones that are showing a motivation or intent to target the industrial environments. So if you've got an adversary that sends a phishing email to a pharmaceutical company, I don't care and we don't track it. But if they're going after the engineers and operators and trying to get into the operational environment, or they do get into the operational environment or even cause impact there, that's when we start to care. And that's what we'd classify as a threat group we track. Um, so at the time, you know, now there's about 22 or so of the ones that we track. And I wanna highlight the trend is not, oh my gosh, look, the threat landscape's growing. Yeah, you could get up any time at any conference any year and say that statement and probably be pretty accurate. What's interesting to me is they kind of fit into three categories. The first category are these groups that are targeting these industrial companies because they want to get access to industrial networks, but haven't done so yet. It's kind of like ICS curious, right? They're trying to get in, they're trying to get to those operational environments. We have no evidence they've actually achieved any actual effects or access into those OT environments. That second category is the ones that have gained access to those operational environments, doing anything from intellectual property theft to just an understanding of what they could do because building capabilities to disrupt physical environments takes time. It's not like you break in and take down a power grid. It doesn't work that way. You gotta build up knowledge over months, if not years, to include the physics of that environment. Cyber plus physics, there you go, your OT environment. 
And then that third category is the ones that have shown the ability and intent, obviously, to cause disruptive effects. They've brought down facilities, they've targeted um, organizations and caused disruption in operation environments, sometimes even physical consequence. And what's interesting in these OT environments is that three categories, if you will, is kind of a hurricane path we can monitor. We see groups in one year that are curious, that start getting access, that move into destruction and disruption. So it gives us a little bit of time. And if defenders take advantage of that time, we have a lot of insights to then think how we're gonna prepare for these groups, not days after the report launches, but months and sometimes years before they get to that next stage. It gives us a really good opportunity. And I wanna dispel, you probably heard me say this before if you listen to me talk, but I wanna dispel one of those myths right up front. I always hear people say, oh, the adversary, whew, all they gotta do is get one thing right and defenders have to protect everything. That is stupid. I just wanna like just throw that out there. So on my time in the government, I spent time on defense, but I also did time on offense being somebody else's APT. And the idea that adversaries just get to do whatever they want and get anything right and they are successful is ridiculous. Actually, adversaries have to do everything right because if they get caught on anything, not only can you disrupt the operation at that company, but you can pivot it to operations well beyond that company. Defenders own our space, own time. If we're using time and analysis to give us that time, you can do a lot of good things. But I'm gonna highlight and focus on the 2022 ones, obviously. So let's get into the first one, uh, and then I'll spend more of my time on Chernovite, which is that pipe dream capability, which people have probably heard of to some degree. So with Betonite, this is one of the groups we found this past year. I think it's quite interesting, um, not just because uh, they're targeting industrial companies, but they're extremely opportunistic. Basically any type of manufacturing and oil and gas environments they can get access to, they do. Uh, and with that night, we've also seen uh, that they've done disruptive effects before, so they'll use ransomware-like capabilities if they need to, but the assessed motivation that we've seen so far is intellectual property theft. And in industrial environments, we obviously put a lot of focus on destruction, disruption, and safety, but companies really need to be mindful that the intellectual property of your companies is very often not stored in the IT networks. Most of the intellectual property of good manufacturing or good type companies uh, in the industrial space is not some trade secret or secret recipe. Like it can be, but it's often not. A lot of times it's how do you take cheaper quality inputs and make higher quality outputs? So it's the manufacturing environment itself. How did you integrate it? How did you build it out? What's the process? What's the engineering behind it? There's a lot of intellectual property and in being able to produce effectively, efficiently, and scalably, uh, scalably, eh, whatever, scalable way, these type of products. So there's a lot of value there, and that's what it seems this adversary is going after. Um, as I mentioned, they've done some, you know, kind of uh, getting access and doing disruptive effects, but for the most part, intellectual property. And I wanna highlight something though. When we think about these OT environments, every year I have to dispel this. Everyone's like, surely nobody still believes in the air gap. Unfortunately, it's still a thing. These environments are highly connected. There are very often not industrial environments anymore outside of maybe nuclear power that are not highly connected. They may not be connected to your IT network though. So a lot of companies go in, look at their enterprise IT networks, try to pen test or assess how to get into OT. They can't, they go, see, we're highly segmented, we're good to go. The problem is all your OEMs, your integrators, your maintenance folks, everything else, they have access. So oftentimes you do need to go through IT to get to OT, it's just rarely your IT that you've gotta go through. It's usually your supply chain or the connections that you set up. And those connections, which are quite interesting, are usually in those internet-facing devices. Over the past couple of years, especially you know, post the, the start of the pandemic, people have realized, adversaries have realized, that we are highly connected, and instead of targeting your IT networks, why not just look for the internet-facing remote access capabilities? The Pulse Secure VPNs, the um, uh, access to the internet-facing assets you may have that's connecting up your historian to a cloud historian, that type of stuff is what we see the adversaries going after. So I definitely encourage people just as an aside, if you're wanting to like pen test the environment, instead of just IT to OT, think about going into OT and pen testing out. Can you find a way out of the OT network? You're likely to find a lot more interesting connections than just trying to go from your IT network in. Now, the one that I wanted to get to and spend a minute on is Chernovite. Uh, back in 2018, I testified to the US Senate Energy Committee and they asked me on the side, one of the questions that you've probably all been asked, Rob, what really keeps you up at night, right? I don't know why everybody has this fetish, but everyone's like, oh my gosh, ask the security people what they're terrified about. I'm like, okay. Um, and my answer was pretty simple. 
It was actually tonight, these days, I sleep well. Why? Because our infrastructure providers, the asset owners and operators, they've done a damn good job of making safe and reliable infrastructure. Even if it wasn't done with security in mind, it's really resilient and reliable, and therefore that adds to security and also lessens the consequence of what can go wrong. So the news articles that have come out about taking down the power grid when a phishing email goes to a company, it's like, well, there's not one power grid. It's not all connected up and automated, and phishing emails don't take power grids down like the laws of physics still win. You know, like it just doesn't work that way. So I, I sleep pretty well. I said, however, the thing I'm concerned about most is that right now, if you wanna do a high consequence attack, physical destruction, large scale disruption, it has to be really specific to that site or that sort of uh, sub industry. In other words, if I create a capability to cause an explosion in an oil and gas facility, it's probably only working at that facility. Why? Because we have very heterogeneous environments. Our environments are kind of custom made to some degree. Lots of different versions and, and uh, aspects of these products, lots of different ways to integrate them, standards and protocols that are not consistent. Heck, every now and then you walk into a power plant and still find Bob's protocol that Bob wrote 20 years ago. Like it's just heterogeneous. I said, however, for all the right reasons, we're moving to homogenous infrastructure. We don't wanna take somebody out of one oil refinery, move them to another and have to completely reskill them. We don't wanna take uh, a vendor that's trying to keep up with vulnerabilities over products that stay out for 20 or 30 years and have to have 10,000 versions of that to manage too. So we're trying for business reasons to go to more homogenous infrastructure. I said, however, what that will mean is scalability and attacks. Right now, they're kind of handcrafted farm to table if you want to cause destruction at a, at a site. But when we go to homogenous infrastructure, we're going to start to see the ability to repeat attacks. I said, the industry is simply not ready for that. We're not there yet. We got to start making investments now. When I went back to testify, I think last month or two months ago to the Senate Energy Committee again, I highlighted pipe dreams specifically and said, hey, that thing I was warning about four years ago, this is the concern. Why is it so concerning? The pipe dream capability, which I'll brief in a second, I'll, I'll get to the details here in a second, but the pipe dream capability, what makes it bad is it's highly scalable and repeatable. It's not something you can just patch away. It's something that when it's in an industrial environment, it's taking advantage of native functionality and features that are already there, and you can pick it up and put it into any industrial environment, and at worst, it's an amazing espionage tool. In most, it's a really reliable disruption tool, and in some cases, it's repeatable on physical destruction in the environments, depending on the physical characteristics of that environment. So it's the first time we've ever seen a cross-industry repeatable attack framework. And that changes the discussion about the time we have to put the defenses in place to respond to it, okay? So let's get into the details and I'll come back and hit that point again. So Chernovite is a, is a threat group that we track. We uh, got called in early 2022 and essentially, statement that I have to say is through Dragos's normal course of business operations we work with an undisclosed third party to identify and analyze the set of capabilities before it was employed okay so let me break down the legal discussion the best that I can we are not saying that this capability was deployed in any of its existing targets we are saying it was employed somewhere in the world I really can't get into much more of it because my hands are kind of tied in NDAs on that part but what you can imagine that means is it was somewhere out in the world, maybe the adversary was testing it somewhere, but not in its actual targets yet, okay? Everybody in cybersecurity community, especially that's been in the military background, had always talked about getting left of boom. How do we get left of boom? How do we go earlier before responding to an attack? This to me was a really good example of an amazing public-private partnership win of getting left of boom. Because when we were allowed to bring in the government and when we were allowed to work with our government partners, I should say, um, what I was very endeared and excited about is CISA, FBI, NSA, DOE, they all stepped up in a massive way. Everybody kept their mouth shut about it, no leaks or anything else. We were able to fully analyze the capability, get the information out to the people that needed it the most, and then when appropriate, start talking publicly about it in a way to advise everybody. And that is, to me, what that kind of collaboration actually should look like. And it was really, really well done. And there's a lot of unnamed people in the government that deserve a lot of credit for how they handled this case. So when Dragos was taking a look at this, um, what I wanna highlight is that CODIS's piece. So let's keep going. 
When we look at this capability, like I said, first scalable cross-industry attack, that, that's good. Seventh ICS malware out there. But the interesting piece is not, hey, it targeted Schneider Electric devices or Omron devices. I think a lot of people focus on that. So we know the capability had two ICS OEMs, Schneider and Omron, that they could explicitly target and capability specifically for them. So people started looking at that and going, ah, if I don't have Schneider and Omron devices, I must be okay. And that is a really bad takeaway, okay? So there were capabilities in this attack framework, if you will, because it's like five different pieces of malware all put into one. So there are capabilities in it explicitly for Schneider and Omron, but there's capabilities in it specifically for everything else as well. And it's that everything else that I want people to focus on. The Schneider and Omron pieces were more likely associated with the initial uh, targets they had in mind, but not the flexibility of all they wanted to target. Think of Pipe Dream as a really good ICS metasploit, okay? It's a framework more than just one sample of malware. The piece that really, really sucks is the OPC UA, Modbus TCP, and Codasys aspects of it. If you wanna talk about what's the similarity between a substation in uh, the electric power industry and an oil refinery, not a lot. But Modbus, OPC, and Codasys, yeah, those are your three. Okay, so Modbus TCP being one of the most common ICS protocols, OPC being a translation layer protocol that everybody uses, and then Codasys is this almost operating system, that, a protocol-aware kind of operating system that gets embedded in a lot of these controllers, these program logic controllers. And the thing that's important here is we don't know where all it is. All right, it's actually a good SBOM use case. If anybody, um, I just hit SBOM, if I hit AI and blockchain, and win the bingo for the day, I think. But, but um, it's actually probably a pretty good SBOM use case, not of what all is in all of our products, but like, where do we all have this version of Codasys? Um, but folks don't know right now, which is unfortunate. What we do know by Codasys um, and their own website and kind of proclaiming this is that there's over 500, I think that's well beyond that now, of the vendors in the ICS community that embed Codasys in their controllers. So you're talking tens of thousands of different product families and devices out across the community. It is highly, highly likely that if you run an industrial asset anywhere in the world, you've got Codasys uh, in that asset. And Codasys allows the adversary and what they're doing with it to do anything they want on the controller. Upload logic, change logic, shut it down, brick it, like anything you could do with an operating system, you can do through Codasys um, with these controllers. That's what makes it so particularly bad is even if they just did the Codasys piece, I'd be up on the stage being like, this is huge and it's a big deal. But then you add Modbus and OPC and all the rest are doing, and it's like, hey y'all, I'm trying not to be hyperbolic and fuddy, but like, please pay attention, this one sucks. Like that's essentially the, the boilerplate narrative of it. And the fact that the capabilities as a whole can use 46% of all the known tactics and techniques associated with disrupting ICS, that's, that's also not ideal. We'll talk about what to do with it in a second. Um, but what I wanna highlight, oh, oops, back one slide. What I want to highlight with this again is it was not used at the sites we think it was going to be used. In Dragos's analysis, not the government's here, I'm going to separate this out, it was probably about 13 sites across the United States in the liquid natural gas and electric industry that it appeared that they had done previous reconnaissance against and it looked like those might be the, the actual targets and fit kind of the profile of what they were doing. I want to be kind of careful in that statement. Um, but this is something that in our analysis, with a high confidence, they were intending to use, and on American soil, probably in Europe as well, but definitely on American soil, and causing disruption and destruction, especially against the initial set of targets and liquid natural gas in the electric industry. That is, in my opinion, the closest we've come. So I, I made a statement, it got picked up in Politico about, hey, this is the closest we've been to disruption, and I think that's understandable that people go, what do you mean close? Well, we have a strategic adversary that picked out targets, made a capability, and actually can employ it, that's pretty close. We've not been that close before. But I'm not trying to say, oh my gosh, everyone freak out, the lights are about to go out. That's, that's not the context, okay? Um, so like I said, we'll come back and talk about how to defend against this um, at the end of the presentation. But I think if you are an industrial asset owner and operator, if you did nothing more than prepare for ransomware across operations and prepare for pipe dream across your operations environments, you would cover most of the security situations of everything else you deal with because the common tactics and techniques of those two together cover just about everything we see in, um, out there. There's offshoots, but you'd at least have a base of protection against just about everything. All right, so in terms of the other threat groups, just to keep the presentation rolling, um, we also give like a highlight every year. These slides are obviously available after. I'm not gonna go bullet by bullet. Um, but out of the 20-something groups that we track, 
try to highlight which the ones that are most active and interesting. Uh, and this would be this group right here. I'm gonna walk through a couple of them in the next couple of slides. But, but um, like I said, after the presentation, you can kind of walk through if you want the specific details. But let me get immediately to Costavite. So what's particularly interesting about Costavite is this is a group that's targeting managed service providers of operational environments. So not managed security providers, but think of like SCADA as a service for wind farms and solar farms as an example. So as we have all these cheaper assets, not all wind farms are cheap. I'm gonna get somebody in the renewable industry to yell at me, not all wind farms are cheap. Many of them are cheaper assets though than a nuclear power plant. So a lot of these cheaper assets, these distributed energy resources, EVs, um, you wanna talk about, uh, again, wind farms, solar farms, et cetera, they're too cheap to have people on site doing everything. And they're too cheap to like really manage them all just as a custom install and still be able to make profit. So a lot of times there's central companies that either operate the assets and don't own them or uh, end up owning and operating but have like a shared service across everything. They're, the more, they're some of the most well-connected industrial infrastructure out there. And Costavite figured that out and instead of targeting one by one the wind farms or one by one the power companies, decided to go to the managed service providers themselves and get access to a lot of these places. Uh, and we ended up doing some instant response cases in this way, but the, the takeaway is that this adversary got access to a bunch of different energy sites across Australia and the United States and was doing the things in the operational environment that were indicative of causing disruption uh, at those sites. We got called in and did instant response before the adversary could achieve its objectives, that's good. Um, but everything that was essentially happened in Ukraine around causing disruption of power is what these folks were, were doing. And it was very clear that there was not an espionage focus. It was a focus of getting into the locations to be able to turn lights off. Um, so because they have that capability, this is somebody we like to t pay attention to. In the past year, they've been uh, relatively active, but the thing that I think is really interesting is the infrastructure they use is starting to get used by a bunch of different adversaries and they're not adversaries that we, we would assess are the same group. So it implies a trust chain between a number of different teams. And I wanna highlight that a lot of times when the cybersecurity industry looks at these groups and throw out whatever name, one of the things that I think you should be careful of is people assume that that means it's China or Russia or Iran or US or whoever. And I think we're being a little bit simplistic in a lot of the cyber threat intelligence industry and in how we categorize and think about these groups because each one of those groups often have their own supply chain. Contractors that build capabilities, their own defense industrial base version of companies that build capabilities, uh, infrastructure teams that only set up infrastructure, capabilities teams that only build capabilities, vulnerability and exploit teams that only do that. The idea that that's any one group is very, very much a defender view trying to put things into an Excel spreadsheet, but not an understanding of how adversaries actually operate. So the fact that we can see Costavite not only doing their operations, but having shared infrastructure with other adversary groups implies either like an infrastructure group in the same government agency that's just only managing the infrastructure and then Costavite and others go do what they want, or contractors, uh, defense industrial based kind of companies, et cetera, for whatever country this is. So again, looking for those trust chains, I don't really care about the attribution piece. I think people way focus on attribution way too much. Um, but I care about the trust aspect to find linked groups and learn about capabilities and tactics and techniques that you actually should care about. So there's quite a bit to dig in there um, if interested. The one that probably is worthy more of discussion is Xenotime. Um, so Xenotime developed the Trisis capability uh, and employed it. So Trisis was a capability, just a refresher for folks, deployed in 2017 in a Saudi Arabian petrochemical facility. Uh, it was the first time ever that a digital capability was explicitly designed to kill people. Um, so the uh, attackers, what they were trying to accomplish was modifying the safety system. Safety systems are only there to protect human life, not protect your plant, not protect equipment, only there to protect human life. So going after one only has the impact of trying to kill people, okay? So they explicitly went after the safety system, trying to remove the safety logic so that they could do an attack on the distributed control system in such a way that would cause physical consequence and kill people at the site. They're very fortunate that the adversary made a mistake because you would have been dealing with probably 30 to 60 deaths at that facility. And when we're talking any deaths, but especially 30, 60, you know, so forth deaths over a cyber attack, probably deserves a little bit of our attention. Um, the adversary did make a mistake though. Uh, they, they messed up their code and instead of causing people to die, it, it only caused hundreds of millions of dollars of damage and disruption. Um, so that's not ideal, but at least it wasn't death. 
Um, the adversaries did, by the way, try to go fix their code and redeploy it because the people at the site didn't think it was a cyber attack. They just thought it was a gremlins in the system, kind of weird operations thing. So the adversaries got a second chance. They patched their malware, if you will, redeployed it, actually had fixed the wrong code, uh, and still just brought down facilities again, which proves that patching doesn't even work for the adversaries. So that's good. Um, <laughs> when we look at uh, this capability, though, it was bad enough when it took place, but what was interesting is that same team, Exenotime, started going and targeting other companies. They ended up accessing an oil and gas company in the US, um, but we have no evidence to suggest that they went further into the safety system, and that company was very mature and kind of did the right things about it. Um, but they've continued to be uh, targeting places, and then we had a lull. And that lull with some of our groups started happening about the time that Russia invaded Ukraine. And so not an implication of attribution, but it was pretty interesting that a couple of the groups we track basically just completely disappeared, refocused all their efforts in Ukraine, and now we're starting to see them go back to their old targeting sets. Xenotime is one of those. So since Ukraine, they've been kind of quiet. Over the past couple of months, they've resurfaced, and we see them targeting liquid natural gas and a lot of maritime, especially maritime associated with imports and exports of liquid natural gas um, across Europe and the United States. Uh, and what we see um, with that right now is just the kind of reconnaissance associated of how do I get into the industrial environment. We have not seen them redeploy a Trisis light capability anywhere. So it's in the picking out targets phase. It's only been a couple of months. That is expected. Pick out targets for a couple of months, get access for a couple of months, then go to effects. So it's still one that especially if you're in liquid natural gas or maritime, and especially if you have any connections to anything associated with Ukraine, you might want to really pay attention to this group and how they operate and make sure that you're able to detect and respond to these type of capabilities in your industrial environment. And in my opinion, that's the biggest gap we have. We've put a lot of work into prevention, a lot. And we've made these environments pretty good. And if you look at all the guidance that comes out from government, NIST, 62443, whatever, about 95% of all the guidance is prevention. So the asset owners and operators are doing exactly what they're told. But that means that less than 5% of the resources tend to go to detection, response, and recovery, which is pretty important if you're actually going to deal with these types of threats. Um, so figuring out how to detect and respond to these types of uh, threats inside that operational environment, think east and west traffic in there, um, that's the big focus here. All right, so in terms of comma site, this is another one where our government, uh, brothers, sisters, and others uh, helped out quite a bit. I think it was the NSA and the FBI and DOE and CISA. It's always like the collection. It's never just one. Um, but uh, uh, they put out that Cyclops Blink um, report. And essentially what was happening is uh, there was malware getting embedded in various like routers and switches, but a lot of routers uh, across the world. And there was a whole cleanup effort that took place. You may remember in like in April, the FBI went around and actually started removing some of the malware out of these devices. Since then, though, we have seen Comasite, the group that we track associated with this, further go and target a bunch of other routers and IP connected devices of industrial assets. Um, so there was kind of a disclosure, a cleanup, and then they resurfaced and started doing the exact same thing again. Now, what's interesting about Comasite uh, is this is the group that Dragos assesses got access to the electric companies uh, in the 2016, uh, and, and maybe 2015, but definitely 2016, power outages in Ukraine. So what essentially happens is Comasite is like the door kicker, okay? They go in and target the IT networks of the power companies they want to get access to, and then, they and then they get into OT, and they hand off that OT access to the effects team. And as I was mentioning earlier, we sometimes have too simplistic of a view of how adversaries operate. This is an example of that. The team that's causing disruption is very often not the team getting access. So this is a very clear, one of the few public examples of a team that is the uh, access operations team, and then hands off their access to Electrum, another group we track, that then goes and actually does the disruption. What does that mean for defenders? It means you should look for comma site in your OT networks, but especially your IT networks. But then if you see them, it's not, let's focus on cleaning them up. It's immediately start looking for the tactics and techniques of Electrum. Because Electrum is the one that comes in and actually causes the power outages, okay? So early warning signs by finding comma site, yeah, kick them out, but then immediately continue down going, oh, this team hands off that access to effects teams, teams that can uh, accomplish effects. We should go look for those instead of saying, we cleaned up their malware, we win. No, 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 no. there's probably another team and you need to go find that one too. Um, the other thing that's just hitting the industry everywhere, of course, is ransomware. I wanna highlight a couple things that, that are different than all the other ransomware kind of presentations you may get. Number one, 
there's a lot more stuff happening than people realize. I feel like there was this era or this like year or two that we're like, ransomware is huge. And then there was a, like a lot of government talk about we're gonna fix this. And then we stopped hearing about it. Well, all the attacks were still happening, if not more. Like it did not stop, it did not get lesser. We have nothing to support that anything was highly effective against them. It's just, I think people kind of got exhausted of talking about it. But if you wanna talk about the number one likelihood of an attack that industrial companies face, it's absolutely ransomware. And as much as I'm all about tracking state actors and disrupting them, I'd start with ransomware and then do the others. And the other takeaway that I'll highlight here uh, is, I'll, I'll highlight two. One, a lot of who's getting hit is manufacturing. So out of the 600 and something attacks that we're aware of last year, 437 of them were in the broad-based manufacturing industry, you know, everything from aviation manufacturing to food and beverage to whatever. And I think that is a hallmark of things to come. It's, it's, a, it's a, a clue of what's to come. Why? Because manufacturing tends to be the most connected infrastructure as an industry. They're absolutely using digital transformation, industry 4.0, whatever you want to call it, but hyper-connectivity and scalability of, of automation. And that hyper-connectivity is what's allowing the ransomware authors to do what they're doing. All of the other industries are moving in that direction. So if you're in electric or oil and gas, you're going, yeah, we're okay, maybe for another year or two. But the same digital transformation projects are happening in every industry. So you should be learning from your peer industries of what they're going through when they're a little bit more advanced than you, because it's coming to a theater near you, right? And so we got to learn from that to make sure we maintain the reliability of the electric, energy, pharmaceutical, et cetera, infrastructure that we have today. Um, the last thing I'll highlight um, about this, and I think is, a, is a, again, kind of an interesting takeaway, is you will hear a lot of news articles or public statements from the companies themselves saying our IT was hit, but not our operational systems. That's it. And I would say that that's sometimes true, but very often not. And we deal with a lot of these cases and deal with a lot of incident response cases and insights, um, even though we're a tech company. And I will tell you, most of the times it hit their operational sites or they wouldn't be stopping operations. What it is is usually a miscommunication around taxonomy. It's a language thing. People go, oh, that's a Windows system. That's, that's IT. No, that Windows system is running engineer workstation software programming your controllers. That's your OT asset. That's actually where the OT word came from was like IT in your plant. So it is a lot of OT stuff getting hit but some teams just aren't educated or, or using the same language around what IT and OT is. And if it's a Windows operating system, they just put it in the IT bucket. That is a very, very, very dangerous thing to do in these operational environments. I, I say this every year, but every year it's not a joke. I respond to more plant outages and power grid attacks, or excuse me, power grid outages from well-intentioned IT people than Russia, China, Iran combined, okay? We gotta be careful in these environments Part of that is understanding that that Windows system you want to treat like an IT asset is most certainly not an IT asset. So a lot of these cases are actually happening in operations and therefore we need to learn from it. In some cases, the companies know better and are just scared to say OT because they're worried about government or uh, legal ramifications. And so they just claim it's IT. Hopefully we as an industry can be a bit more ethical in having an honest conversations because we need to share the lessons learned and do defense correctly. Um, the other thing about ransomware that I'll just highlight, it's kind of uh, connected to what I mentioned earlier about connectivity. There's a ton of connectivity in these environments. If you're looking for a tactical example, go look for RDP and SMB in your OT environments as network protocols. You're gonna find a lot of this connectivity. Um, very often what you will have is something like an OPC protocol used on one interface on something like a historian, but then SMB or RDP using from there up into your IT networks. So inside you're going, oh, we just have OPC, that's fine. No, on the very other side of that dual honed system is the actual connectivity to IT. So that's, that's what you want to look for and identify at a network level. Um, the other thing I'll highlight, of course, is vulnerabilities. Everyone's always interested in vulnerabilities. I think vulnerabilities are important, but I do think we pay way too much focus on it as an industry in OT. Why? In IT, as a broad generalization, a lot of what we care about is system security and data security. Protect the data, encrypt and uh, transit, encrypt and rest, uh, data loss prevention, et cetera. Protect the system, patching, passwords, access controls, endpoint protection systems, application whitelisting, name your flavor. That's also why product security is so important in IT security. If Microsoft screws up an update, everybody's feeling it, and that product security really lowered IT security's capability. 
in OT, it's systems of systems and physics. You compromise an engineer workstation, I don't really give a damn. You compromise an engineer workstation with or without malware vulnerabilities in such a way that you know how to manipulate a controller to cause a physical impact on system three, like a valve or something else, I care a lot. System one's ability to be used against system two in such a way that can manifest a physical uh, situation in system three, that's OT security. That's what we're trying to do. That's also why there's such a big focus on networks. When you look at that, then product security actually becomes a lot less important. I'm not saying product security isn't important. I'm gonna get, again, some product officer to come up to me afterwards. They're like, we're very important. You're beautiful, okay? You're very special. I'm just saying, if we're gonna take a risk-based approach, we need to be aware of what the adversaries are actually doing, not just what we feel is important. And what the adversaries are actually doing is not really using ICS vulnerabilities. How many known ICS vulnerabilities have ever been successfully used in an ICS attack? Zero. Zero. I'm not saying vulnerabilities aren't important. I'm gonna get to another slide that tells you that there are some that are. I'm just saying, if it's zero, why is it the first thing we start yelling about when we go into an environment where we're like, these unpatched legacy systems, it's like, oh, okay, cool, but the lights are on, calm down, right? Like, we're, we're okay. Um, so, when we look at the OT vulnerabilities, we find that there's a lot of issues, okay? So we as a community gotta do better, especially for our original equipment manufacturers. Many of them are really knocking it out of the park and doing better, but there's also hundreds more that really gotta step it up. We analyzed, our Intel team analyzed 465 advisories last year, so all the different advisories representing a lot more vulnerabilities than that, and 34% of all the vulnerabilities were incorrect. Wrong CVSS, wrong hardware sometimes, wrong software, wrong version. Sometimes the vulnerability didn't even exist, but a researcher submitted it, starting the clock for that product security team, so they just quickly pushed out a patch against whatever the proof of concept code was without actually validating that the vulnerability was real in the first place. So we need to dig a little bit deeper to start looking at these. The first issue, so this one, this slide is mainly for the equipment providers um, that'll watch this. The first issue, please, please, please provide mitigation advice besides patching. When we looked at this, 70% of the advisories had a patch, so 30% didn't. Of the 70% that had a patch, 51% of them provided no mitigation advice, it was just patch it or don't. And patching in these environments can be very, very difficult and time consuming. 30% had no patch, 16% of that 30% had no guidance. It was, here's a vulnerability, good luck. Most of the times, it's as simple as a port change or a firewall configuration change or disabling a service that nobody uses anyways. So when we have to go and add all these mitigation advices, our customers like it, but honestly, we shouldn't have to. The OEM should just do that. It's a very simple step to add into your vulnerability disclosure process, and it makes it where patching is not the only option available to people. Why is that so important? Because if you look at the numbers, we assess, we put these categories, we're following uh, Carnegie Mellon CERT when they did this, um, we put them into red, yellow, and green, okay? Well, not on the slide, I know. But yellow, red, yellow, and green, basically, really bad, figure it out eventually, don't ever worry with it, okay? Never next now. These are things that you never have to worry about, these are things you should worry about next cleanup cycle or maintenance cycle, these are things you should take advantage of now. When we look at that now category, we put it into two buckets that qualify for now. Either adversaries are actively using that vulnerability, and so regardless of our opinion on it, it's real, you should, you should take a look at it, or it adds net new functionality into the environment to cause new effects in the environment. What do I mean by that? A lot of the vulnerabilities don't do anything that the adversary doesn't already have access to. Like there was a vulnerability that came out years ago as an example that basically if you had a very specific link that an engineer clicked on on an engineer workstation, it would give you access in root form, right, administrative privileges to the PLC. Who cares? That's the point of the engineer workstation. It has access on the administrative to the PLC to do all the things it needs. So an adversary to use that vulnerability would just be adding an extra step that there's completely unnecessary. You should hope they do that. More forensics, more data, more chances to detect them doing stupid stuff than just doing what they could anyways. Those kind of vulnerabilities are the like never worry with these. But if it's adding net new functionality, you couldn't do an unsafe condition, but now you can do an unsafe condition because of this vulnerability, as an example. Those are things we say like, yeah, that actually matters. With that broad classification, which could cover so many different things, still only 2% this past year. The year before that, 4%. The year before that, 4%. So pretty much two to 4% of the vulnerabilities each year are what you should care about. The rest of them is with extra time and resources that nobody has, feel free to take a look. 
but most of the time, changing a firewall port or just monitoring your network covers all the rest of it. With that 2%, for those of you that work with operations and engineering, when you come in from security, it's always like, here's another dozen things for you to do, and it can be really frustrating. When you're an operator, you're already working 12-hour days, you're already um, overworked and struggling, and the automation environment's getting highly complex, and then there's this other thing coming up, and you gotta do this because China, and it's like, God bless. It's a struggle. But if you go in and say, hey, every year there's like hundreds of vulnerabilities that come out, and because of the investments we're making, because of the visibility we're trying to get and so forth, we're gonna go do the work on the security team, and we're probably only gonna bring you like two to 4% of those each year. That sets a communication, that sets a culture of security is here trying to take stuff off of your plate, not trying to add stuff to your plate. That kind of approach is gonna build bridges between the operations and security folks. Um, from client engagements. So from a client engagement perspective, um, we care about a lot of things, but what we really focus on is the areas that we think are gonna drive the most value against the threats we've seen. So as I point to the slides, Number one, limited to no visibility into OT environments. We're seeing a, a change there. It's down to only 80% of the time. I, I know the bar chart makes it look like it's not that bad. It's only 80% of all the places we go into that don't have any visibility. Um, what I mean by visibility is any ability to detect any of these attacks, any visibility of like root cause analysis and what goes wrong. And I really wanna foot stomp this because it's not just a security benefit. Most organizations are going through highly complex automation projects to where at one point in time, you had an engineer or operator that could troubleshoot whatever happened. You had an engineer or operator that had been to the plant for 20 years, they know everything about that plant. Because of all of the new automation and the complexity of it, now that person has to call an integrator and an OEM and somebody else to understand a subcomponent of their facility. Let me give you an example of this. Uh, and Leslie Carhart is here on a panel this week, so uh, um, uh, maybe you can wrap and talk to them about it as well, uh, one of our instant responders. We got called in to do an instant response case at a power generation facility. And that power generation facility and that company is super mature and does like a lot of great things. Um, but essentially they shut down the plant for maintenance, okay? They were gonna, they have a gas turbine control system that generates electric power. Big type of system, very expensive. Lots of electric power. They brought it down for maintenance. In the morning, as they rolled trucks and getting ready to go to work, the generation unit came back online on its own. I don't need you to be industrial experts to know that doesn't happen. Like, that's not normal. It's not okay for a gas generation unit to be like, you know what, I'm, I'm just gonna turn on today. That's not okay. So they started freaking out. Used to, they could get root cause analysis. That topic of RCA is very, very critical in engineering. As they went and tried to figure it out, the environments were so complex and fully automated that they just didn't know what was going on? So they called in the security team who then called us in thinking it must be cyber. Leslie and team ended up responding to it, um, going and looking at it and determining there was nothing cyber adversary about it. What it was is, and Leslie had the, the really brilliant idea, um, this is a NERC SIP type environment so you can't touch a lot of stuff, you can't like install new tools. Uh, and so they noticed that there was commands, like deployer tech, starting to look at everything, notice that there was commands going from the operator stations to the gas turbine control system to activate it. Went to the station, couldn't install tools, so opened up Windows Paint. I'll let that sit in for a second. I like doing instant response, feel pretty qualified to do it. Never thought about using Windows Paint in an instant response. So then it was not critical at the moment, so they were able to go back to the normal stuff, let it sit there for a little bit, came back you know, hours later, and there were swipes. And Leslie was right, her, their, their intuition was right. What had happened was an integrator had come in and upgraded the distributed control system to have touch screen HMIs, human machine interfaces. In doing so, they had overpressurized it. And what was happening is moths, like the bugs, were getting in at night and hitting the screen, because it was bright. And the pressure of the moth just happened to hit the right location on the HMI maintenance screen to send a control loop command to activate the generation capability. I have dealt with a lot of state actors. I've never had moths in my threat model. Very Grace Hopper, if you will. But the brilliance of this, and the point I'm trying to highlight, is the type of visibility in the tech and things, choose your vendor, doesn't matter. Um, I guess it does, but just not as a pitch. Go do your thing. Um, those type of tech, those type of tools that give visibility and that network visibility, don't sell it as security all the time. Actually, it's just really important for operational resilience and root cause analysis. Security is a side product. And that's the best way to be bridging that IT and OT gap, by the way. All right, so limited no visibility, about 80% of our infrastructure out there. And these are, by the way, the clients that are mature enough to even go and invest in security to bring us in the first place. 
So I bet you the real numbers are much higher. Just as a complete anecdotal, I would say probably 95% of the global infrastructure has no ability to see what's going on in their environments. We essentially have Schrodinger's ICS, so be careful with that. 50% um, of the time, the security perimeters are extremely porous. Like, the teams that go in and our pen test teams are not writing zero days and whatever else, they're just seeing if they can access it. And half the time, even in these pretty good and, and well uh, mature companies, we're finding that you can easily get into the OT environment from IT. Um, and that is the number one defense that people depend on, is the perimeter and segmentation. And when it, half the time it's not working at all, that's not a good place for us to be in, okay? And then external connections to OT, we find about 53% of all of the assessments and casework we do, about 53% of the time, there's numerous undocumented um, external connections. So that's the type of stuff that's gonna get you in trouble in like ransomware. And then lastly, shared IT and OT credentials, again, 54% of the time. Um, this is where we see like Active Directory and domain controllers being shared from IT into OT. If I was gonna tell you one recommendation from an architecture point of view to help you in ransomware cases is go break that. We, we do not want you to be sharing Active Directory and domain controllers between IT and OT. Very often in the ransomware cases, they are targeting IT networks and it gets onto the domain controller and it just rides that thing like a highway of death into the OT environments, okay? So just go ahead and separate that out if you can. It's a good architectural recommendation to make. All right, so as I'm summarizing all this up uh, in the interest of time, uh, a couple months ago, uh, Tim Conway and I over the SANS Institute uh, wrote the five critical controls for ICS cybersecurity. And if you remember, SANS years ago did the top 20 for IT, like here's the 20 critical controls. ASD down in Australia had like the four critical controls. It was kind of these things happening in the community. So what Tim and I did is we said, let's take a step back, let's not consider the other controls, and let's analyze every single ICS cyber attack that's ever taken place. Chart it out across the ICS cyber kill chain, and let's look at what were controls that in every single case were helpful. Not, I like this control, or this is nice, but what was actually effective everywhere. That was our, our measure. And what we found is these five controls were effective in every case we're aware of, every single attack we know of. And it's more meant as a strategy. Because when I get called in or our team gets called in for things like instant response, very often people start with architecture, prevention, all these things, and then get to instant response. And you'll find that the things that you set out to do now don't align with the questions and the data collection and so forth you need in instant response. The top two findings I have when I work with executive staff during instant response is number one, they all have a rosier view of reality of their operations environments. So they think it's in a better place than it actually is. I don't care where you decide to invest, that's your choice, but let's make sure we actually know what we're doing. And then number two, they might have something like 20 to 25 questions that they need from regulatory, SEC, compliance, operations, et cetera. And because they didn't configure their environments correctly ahead of the incident, they can answer like two or three of those questions. So people just aren't getting to what they need because they didn't have a strategy. So the whole idea is start with the incident response plan, identify the scenarios that you care about as a company, which should be things that have actually happened in your industry, and then reverse engineer out what you should have in your environment to help you with that incident response. That will tell you what a defensible architecture is. It should not be an ethical discussion or a dogmatic discussion. It should not be, is this security control good or bad? I, I don't know the ethics of the security control, okay? What it should be is, is this security control relevant against the risk we are trying to reduce? That's the discussion, okay? And so start with, what are we trying to accomplish? Figure out what a defensible architecture looks like to you, then map it to NIST 62443, CMMC, C2M2, whatever model you're using, but those are just like MITRE ATT&CK. They're just a language, a lexicon. It's not a plan. A lot of people will pick up something like 62443 and treat it like a bingo card. Don't do that. Build your strategy, then map what you're doing into a common language that people can understand and communicate. ICS network monitoring and visibility, again, all the network to network system to system interactions of that environment. Then get in secure remote access. I see a lot of people want to start there. Um, I got to uh, lead up the OT portion of the Colonial Pipeline uh, investigation, and Joe Blunt, their CEO, testified in front of Congress about the unauthenticated VPN they didn't know about. There was a lot of things Colonial Pipeline did right. It was actually a lot that they don't get credit for, and they did a lot of good work. But they got caught up by something like that. Yeah, because they didn't actually have visibility or understanding of their environment, and so you can do all the next-gen whatever projects you want, but if you still have all the old unauthenticated VPNs in, you're still gonna get hit. So I always put secure remote access after those things, because you gotta have an inventory and know what you're doing before you then go and try to figure out where you're connecting into. And then lastly, a risk-based vulnerability management, which should really be that, that red category of the two to 4%. 
That's all we should be focused on, okay? Save your resources. Let's not gold plate this problem. There, we are already in a, a crazy world with a lot of things to deal with. We wanna make sure that we're just doing the security that's actually relevant, because unless the industry's changed in the last six months, I don't think all of you are flooded with resources and cash, okay? Like we got things to do, and we have limited resources, so we gotta prioritize. And my last recommendation with this is start with your crown jewels. Start with the things that are most important to your business. Have a conversation with your, whoever is operating like your business continuity plans, have a conversation with your CFO, try to figure out what assets are important. There are some companies that for every one IT network they have, they have over 100 OT networks. So if you're trying to treat this like an enterprise project, you're going to fail. You will, I promise, I've seen it a dozen times. The big four consultant comes in, they've got the Gantt chart of the 20 things you wanna do across the next four to five years. At the end of the five years, you get two or three of them done. Stop doing that. The right way to approach it is figure out, let's say I have 100 sites, 25 of them will put the business out of business if they're not protected, do those 25. Do all five at the 25. Then you can see how it works, lessons learned, incorporate the lessons learned, and then move to the next category. And your bottom 25%, honestly, it might just be okay just to have an instant response plan. As long as you're communicating to your board or execs the risk, let them make the choice. Once the executives sign off on this is the risk portfolio, then it's up to the security team to implement it. But the security teams that I work with a lot of times are trying to figure out what site to even do security at. And that's not something that should be on the security team. That's an element of who's accepting the risk or not, and that's a higher level conversation that's important. So um, I would go check out that paper uh, if you're interested. Like I said, Tim and I have done some webinars and stuff on it. You'll see a lot more coming out from the SANS Institute on the SANS ICS side of the house with that. And then if you want the actual report that I mentioned here, it's just dragos.com slash year in review uh, with the dashes. Uh, with all of the stuff that we put out, of course you want your information, but there's a skip button as well. So, I don't need your email, I just need you to get educated on this because I want my son to grow up with lights and water, okay? So with that, thanks everybody for your time today. I'll be outside answering questions. Oh, we have, we have time now or later? Outside, right? If, yeah, I'll be outside for anybody who wants to ask me questions or like, um, yeah, good stuff. Thanks everybody.